with real confidence. With Babbel, you can speak a language. Just go to Babbel.com and start your first lesson in the language of your choice for free. Download the Babbel app or go to Babbel.com and try it for free. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com. Hey, y'all. Jeff Foxworthy here. Now, if you've ever found yourself repeating the same thing over and over for 75 years, you might be Smokey Bear. Only you can prevent wildfires. That's why I'm filling in for Smokey to switch things up, because there's a lot more to say. And I should know, because my grandfather was a firefighter, and one of the things he taught me is that the people that love the outdoors the most are often the ones accidentally starting wildfires, which means... Always (laughs) B-Y-O-B. No, bring your own bucket to the campfire. And be extra careful with things like burning yard trimmings. Don't just walk away, or chances are you might be starting a wildfire. So for the love of the outdoors, go to SmokeyBear.com to learn more about wildfire prevention. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. This is a Bloomberg. This is a message from the government about the next stage of controlling coronavirus with NHS Test and Trace. To protect your friends and family, testing and tracing must become a new way of life. If you have symptoms, you need to get a test immediately. Don't leave home for any other reason. If you test positive, we will contact you to trace people who you might have infected. From now on, if you're told you've been exposed to an infected person, you must self-isolate for 14 days. Play your part and do the right thing so we can safely return to a more normal life. Go to nhs.uk or call 119. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. You know that feeling when you get more than you expected? Like when your week off is forecast warm and sunny. Or when there's an extra unclaimed sausage left on the barbecue. Or join in Tesco Mobile. And finding out you get the latest phones and 99% UK network coverage. Yeah, that feeling. Nice, isn't it? Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. 99% 4G population coverage indoors and outdoors across UK. At Halfords, we're here to get you where you want to be. We can replace your battery at over 700 stores and garages. Or even at your home or work with our mobile experts. So you can enjoy an engine that starts first time, every time. And start enjoying the open road again. Are we nearly there yet? From battery replacements to tyre fittings to MOTs, there really is no job too big or too small. Halfords, for life's journeys. Listen, that's a dream. Everyone has them, jingling away in the back of our minds. And most of the time, that's where dreams stay. So easy to ignore. Anything can drown them out and everything does. But at Honda, we listen to our dreams. We get right up close. And on really good days, they become reality. From 2022, Honda's mainstream cars will only be hybrid or electric. Honda, the power of dreams. When you buy tech online and you want to make sure you get exactly what you need, would you rather talk to an algorithm? Or to someone called Al? Or Derek? Or Sanjay? Or Sue? Or one of our other tech experts on Shop Live, Curry's PC World's online video call experience. Hey, I'm Ali. How can I help? Isn't it nice to get expert advice from another human being before you buy? They're just a click away. Curry's PC World. Talk to our tech experts online with Shop Live. And financial information 24 hours a day. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg Radio. Now, a global news update. Senate Republicans unveil their police reform bill today. The effort is led by Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina. I hope that both Republicans and Democrats will forget about partisan politics and head in the direction of making this nation safer and better and restoring confidence in the institutions that have authority in this nation as it relates to communities of color. Senator Scott was named to head the effort as the sole black Republican in the U.S. Senate. One of the things Senator Scott's bill does is pressure police departments to ban chokeholds. 
What we can do is not support those departments that will not ban chokeholds. Linda Kenyon, Washington. Now called the Capitol Hill Occupied Protest, demonstrators in the Seattle neighborhood have painted a Black Lives Matter mural on the street. Seattle Police Chief Carmen Best says officers will go in if there are threats to public safety. Leading indices on Wall Street are higher, the Dow up three-tenths of a percent. I'm John Trout. Pandemic information is coming at you so quickly, it's hard to react. Never mind plan. How bad do you think it's going to get? How much more cutting do you need to do? Here's help. Bloomberg Markets, weekday mornings at 10 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm Karen Moscow. U.S. stock index futures are edging higher this morning along with European shares as investors look past a worrying increase in coronavirus cases to government and monetary stimulus. We check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg. S&P futures up 16 points this morning. Dow futures up 146. NASDAQ futures up 56. The DAX in Germany is up six-tenths of a percent. Ten-year Treasury, little change. Yield 0.75 percent. The yield in the two-year, 0.19 percent. Nymex crude oil down eight tenths percent or thirty one cents at thirty eight oh seven a barrel. Comex gold is down nine tenths percent or fifteen dollars sixty cents at seventeen twenty ninety an ounce. The euro one point one two four four against the dollar British pound one point two five six four and the yen's one oh seven point three six. And that's a Bloomberg business flash. Now here's Amy Morris with more on what's going on around the world. Amy. Karen, there are more signs the coronavirus outbreak is getting worse in some U.S. states. Bloomberg's John Tucker joins us with a live update. And to Amy, Florida reported that new cases rose to the highest level since the pandemic began. And Texas saw hospitalizations and new infections surge. Florida has over 80,000 cases. That's up 3.6 percent from a day earlier. Texas registered 2,600 new cases, the most since the pandemic emerged. Separately, researchers in the U.K. say a low-cost anti the inflammatory drug dexamethasone has become the first treatment shown to improve survival in patients with COVID-19. John Tucker, Bloomberg Daybreak. Thank you, John. Attorneys in Tulsa are suing over the president's rally, which is slated for this weekend. They want the venue to require masks and social distancing. And President Trump has signed a police reform measure aimed at curbing police brutality. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on quick take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Amy Morris. This is Bloomberg, Nathan. Okay, Amy, we are live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studios, where it's just about 649 on Wall Street. Time now to check what's going on in D.C., where some of the top stories include President Trump signing that executive order on police use of force. Chairman Powell wrapping up two days of testimony on Capitol Hill today as he presents his semi-annual monetary policy report to the House Financial Services Committee. And the U.S. government suing John Bolton, the former White House uh, National Security Advisor, to try to stop publication of his White House memoir. Also making news, the Senate uh, looking to fast-track legislation on police reform uh, measures of its own. Terry Haynes, founder of Pangea Policy, joins us now. It is really remarkable, Terry, how quickly this issue has moved, uh, not just on Capitol Hill, but on the president's desk with that executive order yesterday. What do you see coming out of uh, the Senate today? Well, what the Senate is doing today, Nathan, is largely uh, a procedural political move. Uh, Again, no denigration here by saying this, but what uh, Senate Majority Leader McConnell and Senator uh, Scott of South Carolina, who's spearheading this on the Republican side, are trying to do is say, look, we're going to bring this bill to the floor next week. And uh, then the question becomes whether there's a a 60-vote margin available uh, to advance it so democrats have a choice uh my gut today is that they that they'll certainly want to vote to advance it to the floor they're not going to want to be obstructionists and they're not going to want to look like obstructionists to prevent the uh, a bill like this from getting to the floor uh but what what you have b- uh between now and the end of the month uh, is a lot of legislating, and that's uh, that's a good thing. We'll have uh, Democrats and Republicans actively engaged on moving this forward in a bipartisan sort of way, and uh, so I think I think that's a, a positive.
positive for the issues and, frankly, a positive for the country. Of course, all the unrest over the last few weeks now seems to be having a political impact. There's a, a new poll, a national poll, just out this morning from Reuters and Ipsos giving Joe Biden a 13 percentage point lead over President Trump. Uh, do you see this upswell uh, dying down anytime soon? Uh, on uh, the upswell on Biden's part, on uh, on, uh, on on, on uh, the the, uh, the racial issue, uh, po- you know, police brutality, uh, the movement oh, that's been sparked uh, by that. Oh no, I think that's uh, that's a very real issue, and it's uh, in uh, in large part it's here to stay. Uh, you know, the uh, what went on in the '60s and '70s is a rough analog here, and by by rough I mean rough, but. Uh, you know, those issues are not going to go away. The, 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 this is not something that I think Washington, or more importantly, the country at large, thinks is an inoculation and uh, and everything returns to normal. Uh, there's there's a desire, a continuing desire, to want to address these things uh, across the country and, uh, I think, frankly, across uh, racial and ethnic groups. Um, that's a good thing. Is it something that affects uh, the, the November election itself? I mean, it's, it's still about five months away. Does this become a central issue? Oh, I think it will. I think it is a central issue, and it will remain so. Uh, but I think it is not going to break in a conventional, uh, easily understood sort of way. The, the there will be a great focus on wanting to change police behavior, wanting to uh, uh, wanting to change uh, and engage in uh, racial dialogue to make sure that African Americans are uh, more fully included in society, don't have to bear the sorts of uh, burdens, large and small, that they uh, that they need to, to bear. And at the same time, uh, I think there's going to be a real continued focus on uh, on law and order and. Uh, and, and wanting to make sure that protests remain peaceful, and what you have there is the uh, is a real wild card issue. I think uh, one that I think breaks on balance more towards President Trump for two reasons. One is that he's already casting himself as the law and order candidate, uh, and secondly, because uh, his base, his core voters, ha- have been shown to have to be much more enthusiastic about coming out and voting, uh, this has been true even in the primaries, frankly, uh, than than Vice President Biden's. Uh, And it is not at all certain uh, that you you make up an enthusiasm gap uh, uh, over this issue this fall. So uh, I don't see it as breaking down along conventional lines, and I I don't see it necessarily as powering a uh, uh, Biden's candidacy forward. Thank you, Terry. As always, good talking with you this morning. Terry Haynes is founder of Pangea Policy. Karen? All right, thanks, Nathan. It is 6.53 on Wall Street. It's time now for the Bloomberg Small Business Report with John Tucker. John, good morning. Hi, Karen. The second stage of New Jersey's reopening is underway across the state. Outdoor dining is allowed with restrictions, and retail businesses are open for limited indoor shopping. But are the customers coming back? Well, it kind of depends. Angela Capadonna is co-owner of Hudson Cafe at the Jersey Shore, and she's with us now. Angela, what kind of effect has the, the pandemic, first of all, had on your business? So usually during the winter, you know, we're pretty packed in size, especially on the weekends. Um, not really uh, that big of a to-go business. Uh, since the pandemic hit, we decided we did not close, and we said we were going to go to strictly, you know, curbside pickup only. And that's uh, worked out for us. You know, we're at about 60% of what our previous business was, but it's still keeping us, you know, going. Now, outdoor dining is allowed to resume with restrictions in New Jersey. How is that going? Well, we just started that, and we are just doing our still our curbside pickup only because we only have about four outside tables. So for now, we're taking it really slow. We're going to see how this goes. We have our four tables set up outside. You can call up for curbside. Still sounds busy there in the background. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 in the mornings we get our uh, you know morning coffee rush. We do a cold brew here and um, a lot of uh, fun uh, you know coffee drinks and stuff like that. Okay, you sound pretty optimistic about this point. Have you gotten any guidance as to when the indoor can open? Um, I just heard on the radio this morning that Governor Murphy said that, um, you know, we're, we might, instead of be months out from indoor dining, it might be weeks. So that's very exciting for us because, you know, we, we miss our customers. We miss seeing you know, all the faces and stuff like that. 
Angela, thanks a lot. Angela Capadonna at the Hudson Cafe in New Jersey. Best of luck. We're uh, going to continue to bring you stories of small businesses trying to get back to normal every day at this time. And yeah, that is your Bloomberg Small Business Report. Karen. John, thank you. It is coming up to 656 on Wall Street. It's time for the Bloomberg NJIT STEM Report. It's brought to you by New Jersey Institute of Technology, providing industry partners with commercially focused research and innovation services through its New Jersey Innovation Institute. To learn more at NJII.com. Now here's what's making news in science, technology, engineering, and math. A new study shows positive results for a drug to treat COVID-19. Oxford University researchers say a low cost and anti-inflammatory drug is the first treatment shown to improve survival in patients. According to the study, deaths in patients who needed assistance to breathe were lower when receiving dexamethasone than among those who received standard care. Overall, dexamethasone reduced deaths by a third among patients on ventilators. Apple's head of diversity and inclusion is leaving. Sources tell us Christy Smith is departing the iPhone company in a move Apple says was planned two months ago. At the same time, CEO Tim Cook says Apple is launching a $100 million racial equity and justice initiative, adding to the company's response to the death of George Floyd last month. The CEOs of Facebook and Alphabet are willing to testify before Congress. Bloomberg News has learned Mark Zuckerberg and Sundar Pichai are opening to a are open to appearing before a panel investigating competition issues in the tech industry. Amazon has already said it would send Jeff Bezos to any hearing, which would mark the first time he appeared before Congress. And shares of Nintendo surging. The stocks climbed along with fears of a second wave of COVID-19 after the company's Switch console was a big hit during global lockdowns. After today's session in Tokyo, Nintendo shares are nearing a 12-year high. And that's your Bloomberg NJIT STEM report. And Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keene, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz is straight ahead. For Nathan Hager, I'm Karen Moscow, and this is Bloomberg. Influential conversations from Bloomberg. This is a message from the government about the next stage of controlling coronavirus with NHS Test and Trace. To protect your friends and family, testing and tracing must become a new way of life. If you have symptoms, you need to get a test immediately. Don't leave home for any other reason. If you test positive, we will contact you to trace people who you might have infected. From now on, if you're told you've been exposed to an infected person, you must self-isolate for 14 days. Play your part and do the right thing so we can safely return to a more normal life. Go to nhs.uk or call 119. Stay alert. Control the virus save lives. We're all having to get used to the new normal and at Birkbeck University we're experts at being adaptable. As London's Evening University we've been flexing around the lives of busy commuters for nearly 200 years and you can find everything you need to secure your place for autumn online. From expert advice to virtual tours, a live chat with our students and course applications. Make the new normal studying for the career that you really want. Search Birkbeck, and it's new problem solved. At Asda, we're helping you shop safely by keeping our stores clean and limiting customer numbers so you can keep two meters apart. With our Scan and Go mobile app, you can reduce contact at the till too. Asda, we're all in this together. Subject to availability, mobile data charges may apply. Dot com on the Bloomberg Business app and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. It's important for the credibility of policymakers to follow through on the commitments they've made. The market has gotten really, really, really negative about the prospect of future inflation. You're going to have a pretty big uh, decline in real disposable income in the third quarter. And the reason is you pack so much of that stimulus into the second quarter. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keene, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. From New York City, for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Equity Futures nicely positive. We're live on Bloomberg TV and radio alongside Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow together with Lisa Bravitz. Tom, you've talked about the cross currents through this week. On the one side, the better than expected economic data. It's a tug of war between that and on the other side, signs of an outbreak in Beijing, China. 
Well, there's no question on international relations is tangible. We just spoke with Stephen Roach, of course, really expert on the fabric of China from Shanghai all the way out to that Indian border. And there's some tangible issues. He said there's no question they're flexing their muscle right now. John, what I would notice in this market, and it's nice on a quiet Wednesday, I know you'll do the data check here. Ben Laidler publishing moments ago reaffirming this bullish consumer view. And that was the game change yesterday with that retail sales report. Yeah, we'll catch up on the geopolitics with Richard Haas a little bit later in the hour, Tom. But looking at this market, equity futures up 19, the S&P 500 focusing a move higher over the last several weeks, up by six-tenths of 1%. Lisa, just surprise after positive surprise, after positive surprise, and the economic surprise index in the United States is absolutely flying. Yeah, it's at a record high and surging even higher after yesterday's retail sales beat. It's hard to even call a beat. I mean, it was just an absolute trounce. Today, we're going to be getting uh, another bunch of data at 8.30 a.m. I'm going to be watching the U.S. May building permits and housing starts just to give us a taste of what we may expect. We just got data showing that U.S. home purchase loan applications hit an 11-year high last week. So that should be uh, some sort of indicator. Also looking ahead to what I'm watching today, 12 p.m., Fed Chair Jay Powell, day two on the Hill. He'll be testifying to the House Financial Services panel. And at 3 p.m., U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer appears before the Senate Finance Committee, appearing earlier in the day in front of the House. John, I am very interested to see whether we're going to see a ratcheting up in tensions between the U.S. and China, a potential risk at a time when the Fed seems to be stamping out any uh, concerns about the lingering effects, even though they are very real amid uh, better-than-expected data, John. It's a good point, Lisa. It's fallen off the radar in the last couple of weeks, hasn't it, Tom? It was there about a month ago, really ramping up tensions between the United States and China, but fading as we come into June. Well, there's some serious issues out there, the compendium of issues, and that makes even this bull market rally make look is even more extraordinary. John, I know you bought at the bottom in March. You were listening to Michael Wilson, and you said, I'm loading the boat in the triple leverage Faro fund in the middle of March. John, on an annualized basis, you're up 350%. That's not bad. I wish we had listened to Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley in the last couple of months, that's for sure. And I'm pleased to say we can start this morning's program with the chief equity strategist here in New York City. Mike, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. What has set you apart for me in the last couple of months is your willingness to say the recession playbook is still intact and there's nothing different about coming out of this contraction compared to all the other contractions. Mike, would that be a fair characterization? Yeah, uh, thanks, guys, uh, for having me. And, and yeah, I think that's a very fair uh, sort of, you know, way we've positioned ourselves, which is essentially, look, you have to put the blinders on a little bit when you go into a recession uh, from a financial market standpoint because markets tend to anticipate these things. And, you know, we've been talking about this setup for over a year or two, and I think that's probably what set us apart, too, is and we, I came into this year kind of more negative than most, expecting – uh, the risk of a recession being higher. So then when, of course, when it happened, you know, the market was actually already ready for that, and then we had a liquidation in, in March. And the other thing that's different this time, though, I think, is that we are in this incredible period of financial repression, and uh, that's obvious. And the one thing I've learned kind of the hard way in the last 10 years is that when risk premium appears, you just have to grab it. And that appeared in March. Uh, we've, we've written about this extensively. As you know, I mean, uh, on an equity risk premium basis, we were as cheap in March as we were in March of '09. And you, you may say, well, how could that be? We weren't down as much. Well, because rates had fallen so much. And so markets have become, you know, uh, attuned to that. And they reacted and, and investors stepped in. And that's what we've been doing. And, and yes, the re- recession playbook has been working as it typically does during these periods. Mike, many people anticipate the bounce that we're seeing of the economic data to flatten out later this summer. And for that reason, they're not willing to extrapolate out the recent upside surprises too far, too quickly. In fact, some people willing to disregard the bounce that we're seeing coming into the month of June. What do you say to those people when you have those conversations at the moment? Well, I mean, look, you you said at the top of the show, uh, I mean, part of the reason why economic surprises are bouncing so much is because expectations, you know, collapsed. And that's also part of our view 
you know, you're getting a V-shaped recovery because your comparisons are just so easy. And, of course, it's going to have to flatten out now because, look, every time the data comes out better, expectations rise. So the, the bar essentially uh, get, gets, uh, gets lifted as well. So it will flatten out, but we still think the rate of change will continue to be positive um, through the rest of this year, uh, quite frankly. And we, we're not expecting us to be back to where we were in the fourth quarter of 19 until the end of next year. In other words, there's still a lot of runway from here to there for the rate of change to continue to increase. And that's what the markets will focus on. The markets will focus on as long as growth is moving forward, the market will continue to look forward. And, you know, it, I, this is, it's really hard to think about it this way, but, you know, we're actually in a recession now that's obvious. Um, that means I don't have to worry about a recession, okay? That means the market doesn't have to worry about a recession like it was perhaps in December and January, not knowing how this is going to play out. Well, we know how it's going to play out now. It's happening, and we know what the policy response is going to be. And so in some ways, you could argue, given these that stocks are long-duration assets, and you've removed the immediate risk of a recession surprising us, it can actually start discounting the future in a more visible way. Mike, how do we rotate in such an unusual and particularly with a fixed income market, odd market? How do we rotate from seven or eight stocks showing, for the most part, profitability and everybody loves them in that to those that are at a 12 multiple, a 15 multiple, dare I say, the richness of a 17 multiple? What will be the catalyst to have those stocks improve on a relative basis? Yeah, that's a, that's the right question, and it's a great question. I think it's it's very simple. Uh, my experience has been that when the relative earnings revision breath uh, starts to favor those cheaper companies, meaning the earnings start going up at a faster rate for those more cyclically geared companies than these you know wonderful secular growers, and and you might say, so well, how could that possibly happen? Well, because the earnings you know were so lousy over the last year or two that they can actually grow faster. In the short term, so those rev- and, and the expectations have come down more. You know, one of the things I worry a little bit about the work from home beneficiaries that you know did really well in the early part of this recovery is that they didn't they didn't really lower their expectations. You know, the analysts continued to keep their es- expectations high. So there's just there's not as much surprise factor potentially as the economy continues to recover, and there could be a little bit of payback, quite frankly, from the the pull forward on the work from home dynamic. Mike, I got to say, one reason why I love reading your reports is your view on the short term paired with the medium and long term talking about last week's sell off, saying it was healthy, overdue. It could be even due for another five to seven uh, percent decline in addition, but it's a buy the dip moment. I want to talk about the risks to that outlook, one of them being the increase, potential increase in trade tensions between the U.S. and China, especially as we see Robert Lighthizer heading to Congress today. How significantly do tensions have to ratchet up for you to reassess your call? Yeah, I mean, this is definitely still a concern that's out there. I think, you know, you all mentioned it earlier, you know, the market didn't seem to be too focused on it anymore. I think the market is focused on it. It's just it's got so many things to focus on from day to day. So there's no doubt that the China, you know, U.S. trade relations are still, you know, fragile. I'd put it that way. Um, You know, and we have far from resolved all of the issues that have been you know, debated. I think a phase two trade deal is pretty much off the table anytime soon. And I guess the risk now is do we roll back the phase one trade deal to some degree. Look, our view is that, uh, you know, we think phase one is okay for now. It's not at risk. Um, however, if, you know, this becomes a, uh, you know, a situation where either candidate, uh, particularly the president, can use to try and bolster their poll numbers, that's where it becomes a bigger risk, and that's probably a third quarter issue. I don't think it's an issue right now. Uh, there's other things that the, the White House is focused on uh, to try and you know get going in the right direction. But if they decide to use it as a lever to uh, bolster uh, the polls, uh, that's where it becomes more dangerous because you know once you go down that path and start saber rattling again, it's hard to pull back in. So I think it's a third quarter issue, and we got to monitor it closely. Well. Mike Wilson, one of your joys is the fabulously concise reports of Betsy Grasick. You get to read that stuff and frame an opinion of the two big to fail banks. What's the Mike Wilson view of American banking, given what you see from Ms. Grasick? Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, look, banking has been a tough gig for the last uh, ten years, and that's what you know. Post financial crisis and a period of financial repression has done. Um, 
uh, you know, there's two two things I think about from here. Uh, first of all, uh, we are you know constructive that the economy is going to improve, and that means the rates, the back end rates, should should move up and and increase the yield curve, which is good for you know net interest margins, and that's a that's a potentially a, a positive tailwind. I think secondarily, you know, everybody's talked about deregulation, you know, over the last few years. It hasn't really uh, led to any kind of big boost in activity, quite frankly. However, one thing I would say is different now is, you know, during the post-financial crisis period, we had what we call the shadow banks in there uh, intervening and, and, and doing their job as the, as the regulated banking system had been kind of, you know, compressed and not being able to operate as effectively for a lot of different reasons. There's a, there is a, a positive argument, I think, to be made that some of that, some of that business, you know, there could be share gains coming back towards the regulated banking system because the Fed clearly needs the banks to be operating efficiently. If they ever want to get inflation, we got to get velocity of money up. I mean, banks are the ones who actually create, you know, real money in the economy. And so, you know, we could see a steeper yield curve. We could see some more deregulation and some share gains back. You know, that's why we're constructive, and we're constructive on the American banking system having kind of a, a rebirth here as we get reflation and we have, we have a recovery. Mike Wilson, you've been constructive, and so far you've been right. Morgan Stanley's chief U.S. equity strategist. Mike, always great to catch up with you, sir. My best to you and to the whole of the team. Equity futures nicely positive, up 19 points on the S&P 500, up six-tenths of 1%. Tom, for me, Beijing, China, wrestling with another outbreak, cancelling 1,200 flights in Beijing. We have to be laser-focused on whether this constrains the economic data as we try and reopen, and whether it really starts to test the tolerance of the policymaker, not just in China, but also here in the United States, as we also experience small outbreaks in various states. Yeah, not only that and not only the virus, but John, let us not forget the Koreas. If all this other stuff wasn't going on, the lead story today would be the tension on the west side of the demilitarized zone. So I would add that into the North Asian mix. We'll cover that next. We'll be catching up with Richard Haas of the Council on Foreign Relations. The president joining us very, very shortly. In this market right now, we advance from New York City this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg. Now let's see what else is going on around the world. Here with the latest headlines is Amy Morris. Good morning, Amy. Good morning, Tom. A milestone for the state of New York, which now has the lowest rate of coronavirus transmission in any U.S. state. Governor Andrew Cuomo says hospitals and group homes can allow visitors, but not yet nursing homes. I understand the demand. I understand the desire. Uh, but uh, the health department doesn't think the reward justifies the risk at this point. Attorneys in Tulsa, Oklahoma, have filed a lawsuit to demand COVID-19 safety measures during President Trump's rally there this Saturday. They say it's not about preventing the rally. They want the venue to require masks and social distancing. President Trump signed an executive order on policing. The Senate will release its legislation today. Former Boston Police Commissioner William Bratton tells Bloomberg TV he believes that the proposals will be embraced by police chiefs, but that it makes sense to shift funding from police departments to other local government agencies. Live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studios, this is Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Amy Morris. This is Bloomberg. Asset managers who seize change to launch new strategies, add distribution channels, or exploit new technology to re-engineer the investor experience are often rewarded. However, in an industry paralyzed with complexity, few act with agility or decisively. Few run their businesses strategically, yet the most competitive managers in the market know with the right partner and a flexible operating system, you can. not Go boldly toward change with SEI Investment Manager Services. Determination and operational strength are both essential factors for growth in asset management. I'm Steve Meyer, President and Head of SEI's Investment Manager Services Division. We know that disruptive forces create opportunities around the world. If you see potential and change, our industry specialists will maximize SEI's integrated platform of data and risk management, global investment operations, compliance support, and investor services to position your asset management business for success. Come grow with us. With SEI Investment Manager Services, you lead the charge in a competitive marketplace. Learn more at seic.com slash change. Thank you. 
Business is constantly evolving. Is your financial printer evolving to keep ahead of the curve? At Command Financial, we are redefining financial printing by providing industry-leading expertise, leveraging technology, and honing processes and best practices. Every day, Command helps SEC registrants, as well as members of their working groups, including securities attorneys and investment bankers, prepare, file, and disseminate regulatory and disclosure documents, such as registration statements, M&A documents, and mutual fund prospectuses and reports. Command provides a full range of services to help you effectively complete your deal, meet your disclosure requirements, and achieve your shareholder communications objectives. Visit our website at commandfinancial.com and learn how we're evolving, not only with the times, but also with your business requirements. Command Financial, redefining financial printing. Influential conversation. This is a message from the government about the next stage of controlling coronavirus with NHS Test and Trace. To protect your friends and family, testing and tracing must become a new way of life. If you have symptoms, you need to get a test immediately. Don't leave home for any other reason. If you test positive, we will contact you to trace people who you might have infected. From now on, if you're told you've been exposed to an infected person, you must self-isolate for 14 days. Play your part and do the right thing so we can safely return to a more normal life. Go to nhs.uk or call 119. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. Tonight, it's a Lotto Triple Rollover. Don't miss out. Play your numbers online or on the app today. Lotto from the National Lottery. Your numbers make amazing happen. Rules and procedures apply. Players must be 16 or over. You know that feeling when you get more than you expected? Like discovering that the box of chocolates has a whole other layer underneath? Or scoring extra poppadoms with your takeaway? Or joining Tesco Mobile? And finding out you get the latest phones and 99% UK network coverage. Yeah, that moment feels good, right? Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. 99% 4G population coverage indoors and outdoors across UK. There are parts of the economy that will struggle to return to uh, their, their old ways of activity because they involve getting people together closely in large groups. And so it's going to take some time to rebuild confidence. And Jay Powell after day one on Capitol Hill. Day two coming right up from New York City this morning. Good morning to all. Alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow together with Lisa Brambitz. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. The shape of this market right now, a couple of hours from the opening bell. We add some weight to the three-day rally on the S&P 500, up another 17 points on the S&P. We advance by around about a half of 1%, coming off the back of a huge upside surprise on retail sales in America with a nice follow-through as well. In the bond market, unchanged on a 10-year. We go nowhere on a 10-year yield to 0.75% on a 30-year yield, up by not even half a basis point to 155. Tom Keane at the moment shaking off a lot of tension, not just on the pandemic data in places yeah. like Beijing, <clears throat> China, but also on foreign relations. And you've been on top of this the last couple of days. India and China, Tom, North Korea, South Korea, a few hot spots starting to boil up in the last couple of days. Well, John, Lisa, I know you want to dive into that, but let me say right now, this is my book of the summer. There's no question about it. Yes, I mentioned Rag and Rajan the other day, his book on community, the third pillar. But Richard Haas has written a jewel called The World, a brief introduction. Ambassador Haas, thank you for jumping back on with us again today. You end your book on order and disorder. Where are we right now? Good morning, Tom. Unfortunately, most of the uh, arrows are pointing in the direction of greater disorder. It was already true before the pandemic, and what the pandemic has done is ex essentially accelerated uh, the pace of history. So whether it's U.S.-Chinese relations deteriorating or the increase in poverty around the world or the increase in the number of refugees, you could go on and on and on. But so far, at least, this is a cloud without a silver lining. Richard, if we can talk about some of the immediate friction in the last couple of days, I think a lot of people are trying to work out what it all means, particularly market participants that might be willing to disregard this. Can you just talk about the significance of what has happened between India and China in the last 48 hours? 
Yeah, this, these are the world's two most populous uh, countries. They've had a uh, essentially undemarcated border, the line of actual control now uh, forever. They fought a war over this, what, 60 years ago. And you've got two armies cheat by jowl. And I don't think either government necessarily wanted to have it come to blows. But any time you have large groups of soldiers over contested areas, uh, there's that, that risk. Both countries now are increasingly nationalist, and we're seeing this as a trend where, you know, whether it's to distract uh, because of problems with the coronavirus or its economic aftershocks. So this was something that, that could have happened. It just did. I think the real question now is whether both countries essentially the government step in and calm things down. Uh, it won't, you won't have any solution, but the question is simply whether you have some kind of a mutual pullback. Do you sense that de-escalation is the path forward at this point? I think it's more likely than not, uh, from what I can see. What was so interesting about the fighting was how almost, pardon the word, almost primitive, with clubs and fists. I mean, there was a kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat we haven't seen since times almost like the Korean War. Uh, so this was really, really localized. So, yeah, if I were a betting man, I would bet nah, that, that there's a pullback. You don't see anything like a, a, a full-scale uh, war. That would be my bet. Well, Richard, the hand-to-hand -hand combat you're talking about perhaps is why some people are shrugging it off, saying, well, at least it's not a nuclear threat, right? But over in North and South Korea, you have the prospects of some sort of altercation picking up after the bombing in North Korea of a South Korean uh, diplomatic, uh, diplomatic entity. I'm just wondering if there is a broader takeaway for all of these percolations of geopolitical tensions that are happening now. You said we're fast-forwarding history. Is there some broader <laughs> takeaway about leadership in the modern world? world well, one i just alluded to that leadership is, is pressed and is looking for you know, wag the dog kind of safety valves the other possibility is you know, look, look at the united states we've got covid we've got the protests we've got the economic problems and it's quite possible that countries around the world are looking to take advantage of a divided and distracted united states so north korea you know we might see this as an opportunity to pressure the South to relieve sanctions. The U.S.-North Korean talks have gone nowhere. North Korea wants economic uh, relief. The U.S.-South Korean relationship is bad because the U.S. has been hammering them. So it's quite possible the North Koreans decided to put pressure on the South to see if they couldn't cut a separate deal. You know, Richard Haas, I know you know, and this is the legacy of the Wright brothers, and how they planted the Department of Physics at Oberlin College. And I know you went to <laughs> physics at Oberlin straight A's. You know physics from for your poets, Oberlin Tom. physics, physics ambassador. Poets. Yeah, physics for poets. You know, as an Oberlin physics giant, that there's a vacuum out there. And the vacuum out there is President Trump in his foreign policy. What happens after one-term Trump or two-term Trump when we try to close that vacuum of foreign policy? Well, I think there is a vacuum. Uh, there has been a pattern of serial withdrawal from the world, a combination of isolationism and unilateralism on the part of the United States. Uh, at the moment, the vacuum is not so much being filled as, as it's being allowed to fester. So you don't see China's not in a position to fill it. The Europeans would like to, but they lack the power. Uh, the more likely things just get messier. So for people you know, from a business point of view, the United States doing less is, uh, you know, we've been in some ways the, the general contractor of global order for, for generations uh, now. I think there's also, though, a big difference between a one- and a two-term Trump presidency. Uh, two terms, uh, I think American alliances might not uh, survive it, or if they survive it, they would be fairly uh, empty. Uh, a one-term Trump presidency, I think, President Biden would try to restore things. The problem is he will inherit, if he is elected, a country that really wants to face inward to deal with our domestic challenges, and he will inherit one of the most daunting, demanding inboxes any president has inherited. And that combination means that it won't be easy for anyone, no matter what his intentions are, to, to turn things around. It'll be difficult. Richard Haas, always great to get your thoughts and perspective and your insight on this program. Thanks for joining us today. The Council on Foreign Relations President and author of the New York Times bestseller, The World, a brief introduction. Headline crossed on a Bloomberg in the last couple of minutes, guys. The EU proposing M&A curbs in a challenge to Chinese takeovers, containing China and the Chinese economic goals of the last 10 years and potentially the next 10 years as well, Tom. Very much a goal of not just the United States, 
but a goal that the EU shares. And the way the continent goes about doing that over the next several years is going to be absolutely key. And whether they share in the effort of the United States is going to be a critical element of that as well. Yeah, you see this interdependency of the developed countries and how they react to China. And John, I would go back to OBE, which is they'll they'll be overcome by events. And I don't know what those events uh, will be, but you just have to be ready. And I'm uncertain how ready we are. Where's the response even to Hong Kong? Much more still to come on this program. Up next, Kevin Walsh, former Federal Reserve Governor. Next on this program, on the Federal Reserve and monetary policy worldwide. With Equity Futures advancing from New York this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on Bloomberg TV and Bloomberg Radio. For the Jewish Communal Fund, Noel Spiegel, former senior partner with Deloitte & Touche and past JCF president, discusses the advantages of a donor-advised fund over a private foundation. There's a lot involved in having a private foundation. You need to engage attorneys, you need to engage accountants, file tax returns. At JCF, all of that is done for you. You don't have to get involved in anything other than making your contribution to your fund and then determining which grants that you want to make. A JCF fund may be opened with a minimum $5,000 contribution of cash or appreciated securities and can be used as an alternative to or together with a private foundation. If you have a foundation, you have to list all of the contributions that you made. Potentially, anybody, because the information is public, can find out exactly which organizations a foundation has made charitable contributions to. Let JCF simplify your philanthropy and protect your privacy. Learn more about JCF's private client group at jcfny.org. Imagine. Imagine being denied an apartment because of your religion, or your race, or because you have children, or a disability. It's so wrong. Yes, but who has the power to stop this? You do. Each of us has the power. The law is on your side. It's illegal for landlords to discriminate because of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, or familial status. If you suspect that you have experienced housing discrimination, file a complaint with HUD immediately so we can investigate it. Fair housing is your right. Use it. To learn more, visit HUD.gov slash fair housing. That's HUD.gov slash fair housing. Or call 1-800-669-9777. 1-800-669-9777. A public service message from HUD in partnership with the National Fair Housing Alliance. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. More and more America. For the friendships. For the fresh air. For the space to grow. For the knowledge. For the sport. For the outdoor education. For the wide horizons. For the academic excellence. For the future. Unleash your child's education at West Buckland School a co-educational day and boarding school in beautiful North Devon. If you're moving to the Southwest for a better quality of life, this is education without compromise in what the Good Schools Guide called a gem of a school in an exceptional location. To see for yourself, find us at westbuckland.com. Tonight, it's a lotto triple rollover. Don't miss out. Play your numbers online or on the app today. Lotto from the National Lottery. Your numbers make amazing happen. Rules and procedures apply. Players must be 16 or over. You know that feeling when you get more than you expected? Like when your week off is forecast warm and sunny. Or when there's an extra unclaimed sausage left on the barbecue. Or join in Tesco Mobile. And finding out you get the latest phones and 99% UK network coverage. Yeah, that feeling. Nice, isn't it? Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. 99% 4G population coverage indoors and outdoors across UK. 
from New York City, this is Bloomberg Surveillance for our audience worldwide. We're live on Bloomberg TV and Bloomberg Radio alongside Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow together with Lisa Bram. It's two hours away from the opening bell. We add some weight to the rally of the last three days. The S&P 500 advancing by 17, call it 18 points on the S&P, up around about six tenths of 1%. Really muted price action in the bond market. Treasuries go nowhere. Your yield on a 10-year, 0.755%. And just to round things out in foreign exchange for you, Mixed session for the US dollar, a little bit weaker against the Aussie, a little bit stronger against the euro, as we wait for day two, Tom Keane, of Chairman Powell on Capitol Hill. Well, there's no question about that, Kevin. We've got somebody here right now, wonderful to speak to. Folks, I want to take you back just a few years, I think 14 years, back to January of 2006, where President Bush made a brilliant set of two appointments. One was identified as Randall Krosner, our great financial economist. We speak to him often. And the other guy was right out of Newman and Redford and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Because all of economics said... Who is that guy? He was the youngest guy appointed ever at 35 years old, and there was a lot of grumbling about Kevin Warsh. And John Farrell, I will tell you this, Kevin Warsh had a distinguished term at the Fed, as everybody was saying when he was leaving, why does that guy have to leave? Well, we all know him now. Kevin Walsh joins us now, the former Fed governor. Kevin, always great to catch up with you, sir. I just want to go back to February and start there if we can. The Fed can't wait to respond to the coronavirus. That was you in the Wall Street Journal in late February. I think pretty much every single one of us on this program agreed with you. Now the conversation has switched almost 180. Has the Fed stepped in too far? Has the Fed done too much? Kevin, how do you respond to that now? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Good to be, Tom, uh, with you and Jonathan. Um, so I'd say a few things. First, when the regime changed in February of this year, that's the job of the central bank to be super aggressive. And the earlier you can be aggressive, frankly, the less you have to do later. Uh, so they moved not with the speed I would have liked, but in historically speaking, pretty quickly. When you look at where they are now, they seem to be moving with overwhelming force. They seem to be incredibly aggressive, even as risk assets are at incredible highs. I wish that same aggressiveness were being uh, felt in the policies they were putting on Main Street. In Main Street, their policies seem to be late, delayed, cumbersome, and frankly, not terribly effective. So that chasm between the aggressiveness to push up risk assets and push down bond spreads doesn't seem to be matched on Main Street. Do you think the focus on one over the other right now is leading to market malfunctioning? They say that every single point objective is about market functioning. I just wonder whether the efforts now are impairing market functioning, Kevin. Yeah, it's a, uh, listen, it's hard for me to say with a straight face that markets aren't functioning well. And that rationale for policy action was uh, astute 60 or 80 days ago. It's really hard for me to say that the aggressive policies, the doubling of the Fed balance sheet, entering bond markets that we never thought about entering uh, in the last crisis, that we're doing that because markets aren't functioning now, that, that, that explanation isn't great. And my own judgment is monetary policy matters at least as much for the reasons it gives as the decisions it makes. So I think that, that rationale is certainly in need of some updating. And if I look at what's happening in markets, with the Fed having this kind of massive imprimatur on financial markets, it's easy to see how they're moving around financial assets. But what ultimately matters, Jonathan, is what you said at the beginning is what about the real economy? And again, it doesn't appear to me as though uh, much of this is trickling down to the real economy in a meaningful way from the Federal Reserve. Well, Kevin, is that the Fed's job? I mean, the Main Street lending program is very new for the Fed because they're going to be taking on credit risk and be becoming responsible for deciding who to lend to, how to lend to them, when to force some companies into bankruptcy. Should the Fed even be doing this or does the responsibility lie elsewhere? So the responsibility really lies in the Congress to come up with what can be done on the real side of the economy. They outsource that responsibility to the Treasury Secretary and the Exchange Stabilization Fund. And then the Treasury took much of their authority and devoted it to the Federal Reserve to stand up this Main Street credit facility. 
Jonathan was kind at the beginning to talk about a Wall Street op-ed I wrote. I wrote about this Main Street credit facility with a much worse name than, than they gave it about three months ago. And what my principle there was is something they frankly haven't adopted, which is uh, provide uh, ample and immediate liquidity to all solvent comers on Main Street with immediate effect against good collateral, but that's not the way the Main Street credit facility works, at least as they've iterated it now several times. I think you're right, Lisa, it's not the Fed's job to be deciding on every loan, but the good news is they happen to regulate 5,000 banks. It is their job. And so again, if I were to have designed that facility as I wrote about 80 days ago, uh, the Fed would have regulated the banking institutions who would have provided loans to their typical clients against good collateral based on their solvency before the crisis. And the only job the Fed would have would be to ensure that the banks would have done proper underwriting. If they would have underwritten a loan to a widget manufacturer in Toledo on February 1st, and they follow those same underwriting standards, then that's a good loan. Any losses that might be had, and surely they might, those losses would be offset by the money that the Treasury Department had granted to the Federal Reserve. I prefer that kind of immediate and ample liquidity to this kind of picking and choosing and to see the aggressiveness again in, in financial markets and the lack of aggressiveness, the slowness of response in Main Street, it makes me actually quite concerned about the real economy. Well, let's talk about what is going to happen in the future, uh, not perhaps uh, just taking a look at what they should have done. You wrote in a recent op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that if policymakers get next steps wrong, 2020 will look a lot like 2008 in terms of the sanguine feeling right now turning into catastrophe later in the year. Do you see policymakers on that path right now? So, you know, we should begin with uh, what Chairman Powell's uh, word is of the moment, uncertainty. We have to have epistemic humility about what we know and epistemic humility about uh, the efficacy of these policy tools. You know, I feel a lot better, Lisa, about the state of play and the risks over the second half of the year if we had used the decade before this crisis putting our own house in order. Uh, Chairman Powell said how it would have been better if Congress had been more fiscally responsible in the decade between these crises. So it would have plenty of flexibility and plenty of credibility to provide massive increases in debt. I think the same is true of the Federal Reserve. Had the uncertainty principle, which they talk about frequently now, been what they talked about between 2010 and 2020, the Fed would have come into this process with a lot more traditional ammunition. It wouldn't be having to reach into all these new markets with uncertain effects. So as I look at the second half of the year, Lisa, what I'd say is a W looks a lot like a V, until it turns out to be a W. And none of us really know the contour of this economy. I guess what I'd say as a final word on this, if you were to take an Olympic swimmer and a novice swimmer like me and you'd locked us down at the bottom of the pool and then you finally unlocked us, well, we'd both be racing up to the surface at some point. But that wouldn't really help us understand who was the Olympic swimmer who was ready to go do 100 laps and who was the guy just trying to get his head above water. Kevin, I've got this image of you in Stanford's water polo team just getting it done out there against Pepperdine. I can just see it coming. Kevin, you are identified more than any economic official and policy official with Republican politics and, of course, the storied family you married into. I don't know if you grew up on third base, but you decided you're living on third base. From your view and with the honesty you've had for decades, are we moving ourselves towards an ever more gilded age is the price of all this funny money and policy that in 2025 or 2030, we are going to be ever more unequal? Well, Tom, I should first disabuse you of your visual, uh, not least of me on the water polo team. I can hardly swim. And uh, and I grew up in a regular family in uh, upstate New York and uh, have parents that are probably so excited to be watching you on TV right now. But in terms of the substance of the question, which is really where at this moment of consequence, we really should be focused. I would say because we've had an aggressive central bank 
not least in times of crisis where we need a central bank to be an emergency authority, but in ordinary times, treating that like it is an emergency, like we've had an emergency every day since the darkest days of 2008. These kinds of aggressive policies do lead to misallocations of capital, do lead to financial assets that trade better than real assets. And there's a certain unfairness to that. So that's why this is no time to be trying to have a philosophical discussion inside the four walls of the Fed. But the idea that they should have been fine tuning between 2010 and 2020, instead of thinking ahead towards what are the risks, you end up with policies now that I'm afraid do tend to take the income inequality and more important, balance sheet inequality. And we make it somewhat unfair. Half of our fellow Americans have not been able to benefit because they don't have equity in a 401k plan or in stocks. They don't have equity in their house. So as they look at the run-up in these markets, they ask themselves the question, what's in it for me? And that's why, again, the Fed's focus should be on the real economy and will let financial markets take care of themselves. Kevin, I'll get told off for squeezing one more question in, but I've got to. That's the comment on monetary policy. What about fiscal and making sure the House was in order there? You touched on that. Is that another way of saying that tax cut a couple of years back was a mistake? So what I'd say is um, fiscal policy has a certainly important role to play. But, Jonathan, too much of the discussion is how big should the next stimulus bill? Frankly, the size of these stimulus packages mean a lot less or a lot less important than the design of them. So when I think about tax policies then and tax policies today, tax policy and fiscal policy more more broadly needs to be designed to encourage investment back in the services sector of the economy, back in the real side of the economy instead of financial flows chasing the S&P at these historic levels. So as I think about the next 